Well, this morning we do want to welcome you to worship. It's going to be another hot July day, isn't it? I, I noticed earlier this morning it's going to be over 100 again. And as we were worshiping, I was looking around the sanctuary and I thought, you know what? We all have lots in common. But here's one thing I know we have in common after this week. There is not a single person in this room that owns a home in Colorado or has access to one, right? It's hot. We're grateful that you're here today. You know, a number of years ago, right in the middle of the summer, I took a trip to the Pacific Northwest. Went with one of my daughters. We were doing a father-daughter camp, and as we were flying into Portland, I looked out the window, and it was going to be a very dreary arrival. You could see the clouds as we flew west. They were building, and they were building, and they were building, and I thought, oh, this is just going to be dreary when we hit the ground. As the pilot was lining up to get us into the airport, he did a hard bank to the left. I was on the right side of the plane, and I looked out the window, and as I did, I saw a sight I'll never forget. I saw the summit of Mount Hood as it rose from the dreariness and the darkness of the clouds, and it was beautiful. It was snow-capped. It was glistening in the late morning sun, and it was one of those things that just burned itself into my memory. I always want to remember that. Well, today we're going to be in Scripture, and we're going to be in a passage that's much like that. A passage that is kind of this mountain peak of theology, of doctrine. It's one that we ought to burn into our hearts and that we ought to remember. And we're going to be looking today in Galatians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open there. Today we're going to be looking at the doctrine of justification. Being justified by faith in Christ. It's part of the series that our pastor led us to uh, begin back on July the 3rd. On July the 3rd, we began to talk about what it means to live a life of freedom. Freedom in Christ. And so today we're going to be looking at this doctrine. It's a doctrine that Martin Luther says is the chief of the chiefest. Now, I'm going to assume there are going to be some people in here today that, that may not have been a part of this series so far, so let me catch you up. The book of Galatians is the earliest of Paul's writings. It's written to a group of churches in what we would call Eastern Turkey. These churches were planted during Paul's first missionary journey, and Paul is beginning to hear about a creeping heresy in that church. It's the heresy of Judaism. The heresy of taking relationship with Christ, faith in Christ, and added to it the burden of the law. That for a Gentile to come into faith, they also had to adopt Jewish practices. In fact, we'll see in uh, Galatians chapter 2, Paul calls it the party of circumcision. Again, adding to what Christ has already done. And so he writes this book in answer to this growing heresy. And last week, Travis Cook did a marvelous job at the beginning of Galatians chapter 2 of setting up an account that Paul shares with the Galatians. It had happened earlier. It happened at the church in Antioch of Syria, a long way away, but it illustrated exactly what Paul was teaching. Now, the church in Antioch of Syria was, a, was the kind of the center, the base of the mission to the Gentiles. Paul was sent out from the church in Antioch. And Paul was there, and he was there for a gathering, and the apostle Peter came up from Jerusalem. And what was described last week was what a picture of the church ought to be. It was the church coming together in fellowship. It's implied that they're worshiping together. And Travis last week talked about the importance of the meal. They ate together. And it was in that that you saw that all the walls had been broken down in this church regarding Gentile and Jew. Because the Jews were freely fellowshipping and they were eating with the Gentiles. Until a group came from Jerusalem. And Paul again calls them Judaizers, the party of the circumcision. And something happens. Peter begins to back off. He doesn't say anything. There's no bold pronouncement on his part. But he begins to back out of what was happening. And it's noticed that he's no longer eating with the entire church. In fact, he's not eating with the Gentiles. Paul notices that others do. And because of Peter's statue, they begin to kind of back off with him. Even, Paul says, Barnabas, his partner in the mission to Gentiles. 
And Paul steps in and he challenges Peter. He challenges him. He used the word hypocrisy. Now, the Greek for hypocrisy we learned last week is it would be as an actor in a Greek play who places a mask on their face so to obscure themselves so they can play the role and they speak their dialogue out from under the mask. And he says, Peter, that's what you're doing. And he challenges Peter, why? They're having a wonderful time. It's like a Texas barbecue and all of a sudden it becomes dramatic and it's tense because Paul recognized that in this church, the gospel was at stake. Now, what we don't know is why Peter did this. You know, Peter's bold. He's brash. Peter Peter had experienced what God had for him in the book of Acts where we hear about Cornelius. He was active and engaged at the Jerusalem council. But Peter, for whatever reason, he begins to back off and he surrenders the courage of his convictions. And he surrenders his freedom. But in so doing, he's wrapping others up in the bondage that is the law. So if you have your Bibles, look with me. Verse 15, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. As Paul makes his argument to the church at Galatia about this heresy. Verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live with Christ, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing." Paul is very emphatic. Christ died for nothing. Now, I hope that you uh, take notes. I do. And I hope that you'll take notes today as we enter into this discussion. I only have two points. My first point is this, that grace, the grace that we receive in Christ, means a freedom from striving, a freedom from works, from effort. No, if you ever do a study of world religions, you're going to see outside of Christianity, every major world religion speaks to the role of works, of effort, of of seeking to earn the acceptance of the deity. You see it in Buddhism. It It has been related that Buddha's last words in 543 BC were, keep working, keep working, work hard to gain your own salvation. Now I want you to contrast those with the words of Jesus, his last words on the cross. What did Jesus say? It is is finished. Christ has done the work for us. Christ has done the work for us. We are accepted through Jesus. We are loved because of the work of Christ. And my friends, we need to understand this. We can't fix ourselves up. It only comes through the grace of Jesus in our lives. Now, if you go into the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus never promoted, you come fix yourself up and come back to me. In fact, there's the parable of the prodigal son, and most of us know this parable. It's a wonderful account of this young man who comes to his father. He's one of two brothers. He comes to his father and he said, Father, I want my half of the inheritance and I want it now. Implying, I've got things to do. His father gives him the half. His father watches as his son walks out the house and down the road. And what Jesus tells us that the son had Mardi Gras every day. It was one big party and he had lots of friends who surrounded him until he didn't. Because the money ran out and the friends disappeared. We find the young man trying to earn his keep at the home of a farmer. Now, he's not a Jewish farmer because he has a pigsty. 
And this good Jewish boy finds himself mucked in mire in the pigsty, wrestling with pigs to get just enough food to sustain himself until one day he comes to himself. And he says, you know what? Even the hired hands at my father's house, they have something to eat. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to ask him if he would just make me as one of his hired hands. And he, he sets off for the father's house. Now the next image is of the father. The father is looking down that road and the impression is that each and every day he was watching down that road hoping this was going to be the day that his son would come back until it was that day. And he sees this gaunt, filthy figure walking down the road and he realizes that's my son. And you see this image of the father gathering up his robes and running down that road to his son. Now think about this for a moment. Did he come up to his son and stop short and say, you are filthy. You stink. You've embarrassed yourself. You've embarrassed me. Go home. Make yourself presentable. And you come back and we're going to talk about how you might earn your way back into the house. It's not the story, is it? It's not the story. The father throws his arms around him. He calls for a robe. He says, this is my son who was a dead. He's now alive. This is my son who was lost and he's now found. Kill the fatty calf. We're going to have a party. And my friends, what we see there is the image of grace. You know, I love the hymn Amazing Grace. And I know so many of you do. But we sing it so often that it loses its meaning. This is amazing grace. Amen? Amen. That's right. You see right here how God sees us. That we are loved. We see the compassion of God. That He calls us to Himself. He reaches out to us. And when you come into Galatians chapter 2, Paul is painting this very stark picture. It's a picture of works and bondage versus grace. It's grace. It's grace. And what we see in this passage is that Paul is helping us understand that when he confronts Peter, it's not because of a messed up barbecue. It's because Peter is trying to bring people back into the bondage of the law, back into this idea, Jesus plus. I heard Pastor Jeff say that on July 3rd. I heard Travis Morrow say it a couple of weeks later, Jesus plus. It means the grace that I have received must be earned over and over and over again by what I do, what I bring to the table. And my friends, the reality is enough is never enough. We can never justify ourselves. So Paul says in verse 16, we are justified by faith in Christ and Christ alone. And that's the doctrine of justification. Now, Martin Luther, about 500 years ago, writes this. He says, this is the truth of the gospel. It is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consisteth. Most necessarily it is, therefore, that we should know this article well. We should teach it to others and beat it into their heads continually. Don't you love that? That we just beat. In fact, he's telling me as the pastor today, as the preacher, I should be beating you over the head with this truth. The reality is we all need that. We all need to be reminded of the love of Jesus Christ. Now, justification is a legal term. Now, if I have been condemned, that means I have been found guilty. I've got some lawyers out here. They'll, they'll affirm this. If I'm condemned, I've been found guilty. And what does that mean? It means that I am going to suffer the consequences of my guilt. Justification is the exact opposite. If I am justified, I am declared legally innocent. I'm not guilty. And what Paul is saying right here to the Judaizers is, we have been justified solely. We have been declared not guilty by Christ and Christ alone. It's why Paul could write in Romans 8, 1, Therefore, because of this, what? What he just articulated. Because of this, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been justified by the very blood of Christ. Romans 5, 8, Paul writes, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when we think about this idea of Jesus plus, what Paul is saying is Jesus plus nothing. 
Nothing equals everything. Again, that's grace. That's the amazing grace that we sing of. I've done nothing to deserve it and nothing to earn it. It is the unmerited favor of God upon us. Now, let's talk about today. I'm looking around this sanctuary. I don't see a single Judaizer in the group. I think we're safe from that heresy. But the problem is that heresy has just morphed across the centuries. Each and every generation has to deal with this idea of works. That's what Martin Luther was captured by this idea of grace. It's what sparked the Reformation. And in our day, it's still present. This idea that we can add to the grace of God by what we do. You know, I can remember back in the mid-90s when I interviewed at Park Cities, I I was talking to my friend, and he had been to seminary out here, and, and he said, Rodney, you need to know in Texas, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot. I mean, those people have a lot of rules. He said, do you know they don't even allow mixed bathing? I thought, well, good, I don't, I don't want to do mixed bathing either. And he said, no, swimming. Okay, it's boys and girls. Well, you, you don't do that, men and women. I mean, there's a lot of rules. So what we can say is Jesus plus rules. Jesus plus good behavior. Now think about where we're located this morning. We are in North Dallas. We're in the Park Cities. It could be Jesus plus our achievement. Jesus plus what we bring to the table. Jesus what I give. Jesus plus my success. Jesus plus what, my, plus what my kids might do. My appearances. It might be, and it was said a few weeks ago, our holding on of tradition. It also could be said our push for reform. If we place any of those before Christ, guess what? We are in essence Judaizers. We're adding to the grace of God. And what we need to understand is when we have been declared not guilty, God is not going to reopen the case. The case is closed. The case is closed. So then what about my works? It's a good question. What about my works? Now at Park Cities, we say that we exist to uh, lead and love all generations to follow Jesus. You know what that is? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Stephen and the choir, the orchestra this morning, that didn't just happen. It's a lot of work. If you're watching us online, it's a lot of work to get this uh, service up and out. I've got grandkids down here this morning. They're in We Worship and one is in toddler area. Guess what? That is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You may be a connect group leader. It's a lot of work. A greeter, you may work in the garage. You just go down the list. Work, 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 work. Megan was talking about the group going to South Texas. I promise you guys, it's a lot of work. You've been there, and it's hot work. You go through all of our mission opportunities here in the city, in Vickery, and Brother Bill's, and Cornerstone. Works. We pray, we give. So what's the difference from what Paul is talking about and the works that we seek as a church to bring to God. It's that question of, are we doing it to bring it to God, to glorify God? Are we doing it as an overflow of the grace that He has given to us? Or are we doing it out of guilt? Out of the sense that I have got to continue to earn my way into the grace of God. That's the difference. You know, the happiest people that I know in this church, and I know a lot of you, are the people that have found that as they give, as they serve, as they just live the life of Christ, they are doing it to the glory of God. I can think of some people right now who their particular life circumstances are really challenging, difficult. But you know what? They continue to give to God They continue to just bring this presence into whatever circumstance they are, whether they're serving in this church on this campus or whether they're in our city or they're elsewhere. They are serving to the very glory of God. Why? What they're doing is they're living out this relationship in Christ. In a few weeks, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, and you're going to see a picture of Jesus. When Paul's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, it's about the Spirit of Christ working His way out of you, and out of you comes love and joy and peace. 
and all the attributes of the Spirit. It's a portrait of Christ. And that's a reflection of growing in likeness to Him. Now here's another doctrine. That's called sanctification. We love, we serve, we give, we do all of this thing because we love Jesus. So two doctrines today. Luther says that the chief of the chiefest is justification, and that would be correct. Justification is going to lead to sanctification, but sanctification never should proceed. In other words, that's becoming works to earn my way into the favor of God. So justification, we are justified solely by faith in Jesus Christ. Look in verse 21. Paul puts an exclamation point right here. He says, for if righteousness, in other words, justification, could be gained through the law, through our works, then Christ died for nothing. Christ died for nothing. Secondly, grace means the freedom to live. Grace means the freedom to live. About a year ago, one of my daughters sent me a photograph of a post she had sent on Instagram, and it's this wild-eyed guy. I mean, he's got this look of fear and frustration on his face, and the caption says, I am tired of living through historical events. Do you feel that way? Are you tired like me? I cringe when I hear a newscaster say the word unprecedented, right? We're tired of that. I've just got this sense there's a low-grade mad all across the United States. Just this low-grade mad. You may find yourself just mad. We don't deserve all of this. We're tired of unending rounds of COVID. It's making its way into our public discourse. You just look at how people treat people out in the world. You just look at it. I was talking to a lady in another church a couple of weeks ago, and she was talking about, she said, I've noticed something since COVID. And I said, what's that? And she said, my church has gotten mean. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, the way they talk to each other. She said, my, my husband is on the leadership team. He wasn't a minister. He was an elder in this church. And she said, people can just be mean. There's this mad in our lives. So how do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? Well, Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, gives us a sense of how we might deal with it. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, and he's writing from house arrest in Rome. He's awaiting trial. His future's uncertain. And Paul writes these words, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Now, does that not sound like the challenges of this day? He says, Then you'll shine among them like stars in the sky, is you hold firmly to the word of life. As you hold firmly to the word of life. You know, my mom would have turned 96 last week, and I thought about her life. She was born uh, the six of 10 kids in rural South Carolina in the Depression. She saw World War II, and you just track the history of our nation. Lots happened by decade, lots of challenges. Lots of challenges. She died during the Afghan war. So many things that they had to deal with, that we've had to deal with. As I thought about that, I thought, you know what? It was the same for her parents. It was the same for their parents. Every generation faces challenges. And so what we have to do in the face of the challenges of this day is ask this question, what would God have me do? And Paul answers it. He said, you're to be like the stars in the middle of a dark West Texas sky shining brightly. In other words, we're to be different. There ought to be a difference about our lives because we follow Jesus Christ. And you know what that means? It means this is a day for the church. You know, the church should not be in retreat. This is a day where the church ought to enter into the discussion of this day. Go home and look at the pages of the morning news. Watch the news this evening. As they're recounting the tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, the church ought to be speaking into that. This is a day for the church. Now, Paul, in this letter to Galatians, he's talking about the role of faith 
And he, he knows how the, the Judaizers think. He had been one. You know Paul's testimony. He was a Pharisee. He said of himself, I'm the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was zealous for the law. He tried murderously to exterminate the early church. And yet he met Jesus. He was justified by faith in Christ. He was covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He was indwelt in by the Holy Spirit. He was called out and he lived out a life of grace and the call that God gave him to reach the Gentiles. And so as he answers them, he answers them with this idea of law and he knows what they're going to think. That if we live this way, we're just saying that it's a license to sin. In other words, why should I, why should I be good? God's going to forgive me. That's exactly what he was thinking. And he answers it in verses 19 and 20. Look with me there as he speaks about how we are to respond He says this, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now what Paul is doing here is he's painting a picture. You see it when someone is in our baptistry. When someone is being baptized, what does the pastor say as they go into the water? You are buried, what? With Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. It's this same picture. We have been crucified with Christ. In other words, the old man is dead. The power of the law is dead within us. We are now risen with Christ. We are His, and we have the freedom to live for Christ. That's the point of this whole series. We are called to live out our freedom. Back on July 3rd, the pastor spoke to the entire church, and and I I told you to take notes. I, I take notes, and so I took some notes of some of the things he said. It was a wonderful message, and one of the things he said was this. Freedom is not doing whatever you want to do. Well, guess what? That's what Paul is saying. Freedom is not license. It's not what you want to do. Freedom is found in doing what you ought to do. It's the oughtness of life. And we are called in our freedom to live out this grace that is within us. Again, as you look at the challenges of the day, we ought to be like stars shining in the midst of the darkness of this generation. There ought to be a difference. I go back, it's a day for the church. And that's what Paul is saying. Now, back on June the 5th, Sunday evening, some of you may have been there, but we had a a church and conference. It's always a highlight of the social season. I hope you'll come next year. (laughs) And we presented the ministry plan for the fiscal year that began on July 1. And within this plan, I, I just listened as we spoke about all that God is doing through your ministries and what He's empowering through your giving. And some of it is really related to the things I'm saying today. This church speaks into the needs of this day. We speak into the needs of immigration as we care for those who come in, as we work in the Vickery Ministries, as we partner for For the Nations, as we try to enter into grace relationships. We speak grace when we fund ministries in the Vickery community, when we seek to be a presence in the school, to encourage the school, to encourage the teachers, to encourage parents as they love their children. We seek to be that as we work in South Dallas at Cornerstone, in West Dallas at Brother Bill's. And you just go down the list of our budget. We are speaking into the needs of this culture. You do that through your service and through your ministry and through your giving. God uses us. And I'm grateful to be a part of that. That is seeking, again, to be a brightness, to be a star in the midst of the darkness of these days. I said in the last hour, one of the values that we profess at Park Cities is the value of innovation. You know, innovation rises from grace. I was talking recently to a person that we're interviewing for a staff position here, and he said, well, describe the church a little bit to me. And I said, well... It's a, it's a big group of type A's. He said, what do you mean? And I said, there's never a lack for opinions, right? 
never a lack for opinions. And I said, that is God's grace to us. We have men and women who are so committed to the ongoing work of the gospel. They pray about it. They think hard about it. And I said, some incredible innovative ideas have sprung out from the body because of that. Innovation. We ought to continue to try to build that within ourselves as we seek in this place, at this address, to address the needs of this day. To address the needs of this day. So as we close today, I'm looking at some people that I know. There's a few of you. You've been in this church for well over 60 years. You've followed Jesus faithfully. But you know what? You still need to hear these words. You're loved. You're loved. You need to every day just tell yourself, beat yourself over the head, I am loved. There's some of you that have been following Jesus for not nearly that long, and you need to hear the same message, I am loved. Some of you are challenged by the events of this day, whether it be what's happening politically or happening within our culture or maybe personally in your family, your health, and there's challenges. You need to remind yourself, despite the challenges, I am loved. You see God in His grace and you don't forget that in the midst of this time that the joy that you may be seeking might be best seen as you speak out into this day. You know, grace was never meant to be dammed up within us. We're to be channels of grace. We're to be conduits of what God is wanting to do in this community. You know, I firmly believe that this place ought to be the happiest place in Dallas. I'm convinced. We've got the greatest people in the city of Dallas in the Metroplex. This ought to be the happiest location. But you know what? We need to take that happy, that grace, out of this building. And when you leave today, you ought to just be building a channel of grace back into your neighborhood. You need to be building a channel of grace into your kids' activities, into your clubs and into your businesses, into your neighborhoods. You need to be that person. Now, I want you to look around the room. If you look around this room, you might could draw several reactions. I'm going to give you a very positive one. We have room. We have room. And I mean that very positively. If all of us would take seriously the call to be a grace giver, to be a person that is seeking to bring people along, inviting them to be with you, guess what? There's a place here for them. There's a place in the Great Hall. There's a place in Espanol. We have multi-venues. There is a place for people to come and experience the grace to understand what it means to be justified by faith in Christ, to understand that their gifts matter and that they can be a part of a movement to be a a shining light in the midst of this darkness. I was talking to Pastor Jeff. He actually is in Colorado this week. He is leading a camp and he's had opportunity in the last week or so to really be thinking deeply about the fall and moving into the winter months and lots of plans. And he and I were talking briefly the other day about how excited we are. There are new opportunities coming this fall to enrich your spiritual life, your discipleship, what it means to follow Christ, to enrich your relationships. Just some great things. Just watch for some upcoming announcements. And we were talking about this idea that as a church, we need to be about building or rebuilding after COVID this kind of an invitational culture where you're asking people to join you, to be a part of what God is doing in your life and in this place. God can use you. So if you're here today and you've never been with us before, maybe you're online. I would encourage you, enter into the conversation about what grace and faith means in your life. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, you've never accepted the fact that He has justified you and that He wants you into a relationship with Him, to come to Him in repentance, to be the Lord of your life, we'd love to talk with you about that. If you're here today, and as Megan said, you're new to this church, and you're thinking about what it might mean to be a part of it, we'd like to talk with you about that. There are needs that are present today. Following this service, if you're online, you can start the conversation in the chat. 
If you're here in the sanctuary, right out those doors. I'll be there. Us will be there. Megan will be there. We'd love to talk with you about all of these things. What it means to be a person who lives out the freedom that is ours in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather, to worship. And Lord, I pray as we consider this word that you would speak to the need of this day what you would have for us. We'll trust you in that. In Jesus' name, amen.